Miracy. Despite, you know, us talking about this for quite some time, there still seems to be this widespread perception that you can just, like, jump in and create a course and, like, build some content and then you have a nice course. But we know from hard-won experience as well as to talking to people like Melissa that it just doesn't work that way. You've got to get your hands dirty. Hello and welcome to Course Lab, the show that teaches creators like you how to make better online courses. I'm Danny Eaney, the founder and CEO of Miracy, and I'm here with my co-host, Abe Crystal, the co-founder of Rizuku. Hey there, Danny. In each episode of Course Lab, we showcase a course and creator who is doing something really interesting, either with the architecture of their course or the business model behind it, or both. Today, we welcome Melissa Guller. Melissa is the founder of Wit and & Wire and the host of the Wit & Wire podcast. Melissa, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So let's start at just 30,000 feet. Tell us who you are, tell us what you do, tell us how you came to be doing it, and how did that eventually make its way to online courses? Through following opportunities, I ended up working full-time for General Assembly in New York and producing their in-person classes and workshops and then starting to teach there as well. And as I started teaching, people would ask me if I offered tutoring or consulting, and I just kind of kept saying yes. And then in my full-time roles... I then had the opportunity to work for Ramit Sethi, the New York Times bestseller, eight-figure course creator, and that really opened my eyes to the possibilities in the world of online courses. I had no idea people were willing to spend that kind of money to learn online, and that experience led me to work at Teachable, a course creation platform where I worked for four years. I produced all of Teachable U, their curriculum for course creators, and although that was a dream job, Ultimately, what led me to start my own business was the inspiration I felt just watching all of these business owners sell courses on drone flying and watercolor painting and this instrument called the hand pan I had never heard of. And I knew that I wanted to do that on my own and help others do the same. Awesome. So tell us more about Wit and Wire. Where does that name come from, first of all? Like, what does it allude to? It comes from, first of all, hours of hating the naming process. I think a core part of any business is feeling stressed about the name. Originally, my thought was that the word wit kind of was an allusion to knowledge and what you knew, and the term wire was more about communication. So I knew I wanted to help people share what they knew and their skills and passions online, and I wanted to help them find different ways that they could do that. So the inspiration was always to work with online business owners. So even though I knew I wanted to work with course creators one day, the first signature program that I launched through Wit & Wire was actually about podcasting. I felt like that was something I had already had experience doing. I'm very comfortable with tech and production. And I founded Teachable's podcast as well. And that was number two in the US. And so I felt like I could help more people maybe debunk the process. But I also wanted to prove to myself that I couldn't just help other people launch courses, that I could launch one and scale it up as well. So that was my first signature program. And then after that kind of became in a more evergreen state and it's very up and running. I don't have to do much with it today. That's when I started to shift focus and say, okay, now enough students are asking me, how did you make this great course? I want to make something like you did. It's time to pursue the big vision for this company. Awesome. And I I think that's a common pathway for a lot of people who get into eventually teaching people how to create online courses. It's like, you've got to do it once, at least once, ideally many times yourself and do it well. And then people will ask you, hey, tell me how you did this. Although with your background, you probably could have stepped straight into, I'm going to teach you how to create online courses because you had been doing it in a lot of ways. But I I totally get that journey. You know what I'm curious about with the podcasting course? I want to hear about the work you're doing today as well. But with the podcasting course, doing a good job creating a good podcast is so much about obviously what people sound like. How do you evaluate that and give them that feedback in a semi-automated kind of format? How did you thread that needle? Well, I think, first of all, that there's no such thing as a bad voice for podcasting or a bad perspective. That was a big fear I heard a lot. I have a huge, heavy Southern twang or I'm not a native U.S. speaker. Can I have a podcast? So I do think that part of it is a myth. But then in terms of like quality and output, that's definitely where breaking down the process into very piecemeal parts came into play. And one of the things that maybe doesn't get talked about often enough in course creation is that your goal is to simplify somebody's work as much as possible, but that doesn't mean more courses, more videos, more trainings. I think that's becoming more common today. But for me, it's things like, how can I create templates? How can I create starter scripts? How can I show them good examples? 
How can I even connect people in my own community to see what my success stories are doing so that they can emulate what's working today? And something that I wouldn't have realized starting the podcasting course first, but now appreciate is the fact that I do think that courses have evolved, especially during the pandemic with more people feeling comfortable learning online. I think their expectations about what a good course looks like have changed. And so by launching that program in 2020, I think I was able to see what course creation felt like in that year versus when I was working for Remit four or five years prior. So for me, the best way I can offer support is to appeal to different learning styles. So by that, I mean, I offer different features for support in the program. My expectation isn't that everyone needs all of them. Instead, it's that I want at least one support channel to suit each learning style. So in the course, I have checkpoints throughout where I ask them to submit information. Not only does that help me track their progress, but I also include a question at the bottom if they have any open questions or something they think I could do. And that helps me keep a really strong pulse on what I might have missed that I could incorporate. But it also gives me the opportunity to see what they're doing. And when you submit a checkpoint as a student, it is a form of accountability. It is a sense of accomplishment when you submit something. So I think that helped keep people motivated to move forward. But then I do live weekly group coaching. I do personalized reviews of their work. If they post their cover artwork, they're going to get a video reply from me and my community. So I think it's a mix of all different things where they know they're not in it alone. I'd just love to hear you expand more on what you've seen in the evolution of courses over the last few years. I feel like you've had an interesting vantage point on that and, and maybe seen a number of different niches and, and worked with different types of course creators. So I would love for you to go deeper into what have you seen changing in courses over the last few years? What's been evolving? And then maybe we can carry that forward into a conversation about where a course is going in the future. When I first started working for Remit, an online course was a series of videos, maybe with PDFs, but it really was a self-study. And in order to access the instructor or even other students felt rare. That felt more like a membership model. And at the time, I would say a membership was really more of a forum. And these were two separate products that felt different. But now it feels like they are blurring a little bit. There's more community elements in the course creation world where you may expect the opportunity to connect with other students or to share your work or to see what other people are up to. And even in the membership sphere, there's an element of potentially education or course library, a template library, not always. But I see them kind of moving towards each other a bit more. And I'll say even as a student, because I love to learn, I take a lot of online courses. And if I pay a certain price today for a course, I expect some engagement with the instructor. I'm no longer thinking it's going to be me on my laptop in a solo mission. Now I'm expecting the opportunity to either ask questions or to get feedback or to get review, maybe on some copy that I've written. I definitely think there's more of an interaction to courses today. And I'm curious to hear what both of you might think as well. Oh, I, I agree with that completely. I mean, I've been, I, I think doing that sort of blurring of the lines and providing the appropriate level of support to help people get the results um, and community when, when appropriate as well. I think that was always a plus, but in the last few years, we've kind of tipped past this, this key point where, you know, it's not so much that doing it as a plus, it's now not doing it as a minus. Like you can't really get away without doing it anymore. How do you see that then? And this is asking you to gaze into a crystal ball a bit. So it may be somewhat murky, but if we're on the same page that we've seen that shift from self-paced video courses to sport, coaching, implementation, and so on. What's next, right? So the bar has been raised to that level. Where do we go from here? Well, I think an interesting question to ask is, if I, the instructor, am now more involved, how does that affect people's desire to have this passive income, set it and forget it dream that people associate with online course creation? Because I am involved with students. I could actively tell you what their businesses are about. I'm spending time replying to them and doing these coaching calls. And it doesn't have to be so time intensive. It doesn't need to be five, 10 hours a week. But I do think you have to budget more of your time to be interfacing with students and frankly, updating curriculum. Like the podcasting industry is a great example. The technology, the styles, the accessibility of a user's ability to create a podcast, it's evolved quite a bit in the last few years. So keeping my course updated has been a huge competitive advantage. Because other programs that are still stuck in 2019 or earlier 
they really don't represent what's going on today in podcasting. But I think gazing into the future, I would guess there will be more of a shift towards quality, fewer courses rather than libraries of maybe less expensive courses at scale. It's not that there's not a place for that, but I see courses under $100 with no instructor interaction as more of a lead gen, building your audience, kind of an intro offer method. And I see the type of course that we're talking about where there is potentially a coaching or a review or an interface as more of the signature product that, let's say you're a service provider, that's going to be the thing that can help you scale to a new level. So that's the direction that I'm seeing. Yeah, that's also the category where people like us and the people that we work with have the opportunity to differentiate from the Udemy's and the master classes where, you know, for them, the volume play of $100 courses makes sense for the celebrities on Masterclass who are not interested in doing any kind of coaching. Obviously, I just want to produce some content and have the, the residuals. It, it makes sense for them. And we can't compete with them on the celebrity factor that they bring to the table or, or the unit economics of, you know, being able to sell $100 courses because they have, a, you know, $100 million of venture capital in the bank. But they can't really play in the, you know, multi-thousand dollar lots of coaching and support courses because they're not set up for that. And that's where the real advantage is for the sort of people that you and I work with. And I think it's a myth that selling cheaper courses is easier because people always say that to me. They say, oh, I want it to be more accessible so that more people can buy it. And that's why they want to charge $50 or $100. But I forget where I've seen this stat, but it's often the 80-20 rule of like 20% of your audience is willing to pay you like five times as much as the remainder. And so I, from what I've experienced and seen with my own students, if you charge at a premium price for something that is actually worth that value, like not stuffing the price and just charging senselessly, but if you find a solution that's worth a higher price point, it is going to be easier to scale on all fronts. You'll need fewer students to purchase, which means supporting fewer students, because that's another thing we can't do as smaller businesses is support the number of students purchasing these inexpensive courses. So I just think that the economics work out much better to sell at a premium price point. I also think something that gets sacrificed when you are trying to do a fully self-paced program is the opportunity to pay attention to what your students are telling you, like to hear the signals. I know I mentioned doing things like checkpoints throughout the course, but to me, that's been some of the like secrets also of how I've made courses that are so effective. Like a lot of my students have told me that my courses are the only ones they've ever finished. And a big part of that is because I've learned where students get hung up and I build curriculum not only on actions that move students forward, but anticipating the objections that might hold them back. And then there's an adult learning theory principle called learn, practice, apply that I'm not sure has been brought up on your podcast. You can tell me if it's been too redundant to get into though. Well, I mean, let's assume that people listening to this may not have perfect recall. So, so sure, go for it. <laughs> so there's a, a theory in adult learning theory called Learn, Practice, Apply. It's from the University of Phoenix. And it says that adults need a sense of structure and a path forward in a linear way in order to learn. And to do that, there's this cycle of L, which stands for learn, P for practice, and A for apply. So in the learn stage, that's what most courses give you. They give you lessons, theories, concepts, and they tell you what needs to be done. I would say where most courses fail is to incorporate the P, which is practice. Because if you give somebody a new teaching and then you tell them to apply it to their life, which is the A, there's often too big of a gap. Like if you taught somebody how to write a song, but they'd never done it before, and you said, go off and write a one minute song, it's too overwhelming. So you need the middle piece, which is the practice, either where you give them a tune and you have them transcribe it, or you give them, like in my programs, I give people assets and have them edit my own video so they can learn how to do those things. And it really decreases the odds of feeling overwhelmed. I can't do this. I don't know where to start. So I think that more courses would benefit from incorporating these elements of practice. And I think that's what you can't do maybe at scale or maybe just if you don't have that teaching background um, before you get to just to round it out, the A, apply. After they practice, they apply it to themselves. They've practiced writing a paragraph on your topic. Now that they can go off and write a short essay on a slightly bigger prompt. And that's the kind of thing as well that when you incorporate those into your own program and you can see like where people are getting stuck, 
if you notice there's a certain section where there's fall off, maybe it's the practice element that hasn't been included. Is there something preventing them from moving forward because they didn't feel comfortable with the technology or the new skill that you've taught them? What else have you found in your in your toolbox that helps your your course creators actually progress and kind of do the work? Potentially from my background in event production, when you teach online, what a lot of people don't immediately realize is that you're not just creating curriculum, you are producing a full experience. And you are responsible from the moment of purchase through the moment of success. And at each of those moments, there are emotions that your students will be feeling that you need to take into consideration. Like at the moment of purchase, that's such a big moment. And your new student will immediately wonder, am I in the right place? What do I need to do? Where should I go? What should I do first? And as a course creator, it's our responsibility to create a very clear onboarding experience, not only telling them here is where the course lives, but just being very literal about here is where I want you to start. Here is what the experience looks like. Here's a high level overview of the process so that you know what to expect. And a personal favorite, I like to include onboarding forms in my course. Not only do I learn what students expect to feel challenged by, what their goals are. And yes, a lot of this does turn into marketing copy, which really helps me sell my own programs. But I've had students tell me that submitting an onboarding form helps them commit to their own motivation. And adult learners are intrinsically motivated to achieve their results. So if you can help them label it right at the start, already you're giving them a quick win right at the front to help them feel that momentum as they move into the course. Yeah, I like that analogy of event production. I think that'll be helpful for people. It is. It really is like walking into a room. Like, how do they feel the moment that they walk into the room that is your digital classroom? I used to teach in person, and so I would just bring my curriculum. The classroom was already built. The student would walk into the building. They would be greeted. They would walk in. They would sit down. We don't have that. We have to create that for ourselves. So I think imagining it almost as like the host of the party can be a helpful analogy. Anything else, Danny? Well, I guess the question that comes to mind is... I mean, you're in the business of teaching people how to create online courses and you do through online courses and it's a little bit meta. And, you know, I get it. (laughs) We're in the same boat. And what I've noticed is that that can sometimes create a situation where because you're doing online courses all day, every day in a million different contexts, it allows you to really be on the cutting edge and you implement some of those cutting edge things that make sense because of your level of skill and sophistication, because of the scale at which you're operating but don't always make sense for your students to apply right away. They're like, you know, this is step 10, not step one. Um, But sometimes they're, they're cool, they're flashy, they're sexy. It's the stuff that they come in, they're like, show me how to do that. And you have to caution them. It's like, this is a great thing to do, but not yet. Do you have any of those things that you do that people commonly note and get excited about? And you're like, you should absolutely do this, but don't start here. Definitely, tons. Actually, a big backbone of like my philosophy on course creation, which I know aligns closely with what both of you talk about as well, is the fact that the course that you launch on day one is not going to look how it looks in a year. And if you try to go to that future state of fully self-paced curriculum, all the bells and whistles, all the marketing, all the ads, like if you try to jump right to that before you try some steps to validate your idea or maybe run more of an MVP model first, it's going to be a very challenging uphill battle if it becomes profitable at all. So I think a good mindset for course creators and frankly, business owners to have is that your teaching and marketing strategies will evolve as your business grows. Like that's the backbone of what I happen to call the course lifecycle method, but is very similar to a lot of other teachings where my courses have been successful because I've done things at first that don't scale. I have offered more one-on-one attention, like bonus calls. I've taught live workshops. The first iterations of each of my signature programs could not have scaled either in the teaching strategies or the level of support that I was doing. And the marketing was different. I was talking to people individually. I was in email one-on-one convos, DMs, occasionally phone calls. I was really trying to not only learn about what people wanted, but I was trying to build personal connections. And then after the first time when I had validated demand, then it made sense for me to invest in building out the full course and then scaling up to marketing. And then Danny, to answer your question even more directly, the thing people see me doing is webinars. Webinars are a great strategy for course creators. I'm sure we've all seen very big names, seven, eight figure course creators using them very successfully and I use them too. But if you are brand new and your course is brand new, I think the problem is that if you launch a new course and you do all these marketing things you hear about, big launches, 47 emails, webinar ads, if it doesn't sell, how are you gonna know 
if it was the marketing that didn't work or the offer itself. And there's this direct response copywriting principle, the 40-40-20 rule, which says when somebody makes a purchase, 40% of their decision is, are they interested in the offer? 40% is, are they in the right audience? And 20% is all the creative, the marketing, the design, the pages. So 80% of their decision just comes down to, did I sell the right thing to the right person? Yet, what I see online business owners spending all of their time on is tweaking the marketing and assuming that the marketing is the reason that it didn't sell. So for newer course creators, I think really focusing on, can this offer sell? And then crucially, can I get students an outcome? Those are the two areas that I think are so important. And then after you've proven both of those two concepts, then I think it makes sense to shift gears and start creating sales engines, webinars, whatever suits you. It doesn't have to be a webinar, but it makes sense to start driving more traffic to your proven offer. Awesome. That was great. I don't have anything else. I think people are going to really get a lot out of this conversation. Abe, you want to do the readout? Yeah. Melissa Guller is the founder of Wit & Wire, as well as the host of the Wit & Wire podcast. To find out more about her and her upcoming courses, head over to witandwire.com. That's witandwire.com. Now stick around for my favorite part of the show, where Abe and I will pull out the best takeaways for you to apply to your course. Abe, there were a lot of takeaways here. We could pretty much go point by point through the entire conversation, which of course we won't. Um, But what were some of the highlights for you? Overall, the philosophy that was presented, I think, is really valuable. That it's focused on, first of all, as she put it, looking at your course from the lens of event production rather than like content creation or just delivering information. And so thinking about what goes into creating a really amazing conference or a magical retreat and trying to bring some of that perspective and the focus on uh, participant experience into your courses is a really helpful lens, a starting point. And then within that broad approach, using specific techniques that are really focused on helping participants learn more deeply and move forward more effectively. And two that she highlighted, I thought that are really good takeaways uh, for everyone listening are this idea of having uh, checkpoints within the course where she's asking people to check in and either submit work or submit an assessment on how they're doing, and then having interaction and feedback with people based on that so that they're really feeling supported and heard during the course, you know, not, not alone. And then the second is the learn, practice, apply model. People present that type of idea in different ways, but I think that that's a really nice and catchy and easy way to remember it, that you can't just give people some useful, well-presented information and then say, okay, great, now just go apply it and and you're ready to use this in your life or in your work. You have to think through what is it going to take for them to actually be able to apply this. And she gave the example of um, if you're going to teach people audio or video editing, give them some audio and video files and a specific step-by-step of, hey, here's an edit I want you to do on this file that I've already prepared for you. And that's a much easier way to get started than saying like, okay, I want you to just go out and create your own video and edit it for me, right? That may be too daunting. So those, I thought those were really helpful and actionable techniques that, that people can use in their own courses. Yeah, and there's an important nuance to take away from that example, which is that it does two things, because there are two things that make it hard to apply something that you just learned. One is if the scope of what you're trying to do is broad and that adds a lot of complexity and ambiguity. The other is if there is a lot of emotional weight or sensitivity to the work that you're taking on. And so go produce your own video is hard on both of those fronts, right? It's hard because you've got to produce the video and there's a technical complexity and the content and all those things. But it's also hard because it's a video that is yours about your stuff and your world and your business and your life, and, and it's sensitive. And so shrinking the scope, but also making it about something that is an, clearly an exercise and not so personal or, or loaded, um, both of those make it a lot easier to do that practice. Uh, I thought that was a really good example. And the, the other thing that jumped out to me was that interplay between I mean, Melissa came to this world with an enormous amount of experience between her work at Teachable and her own classes, and she has a better part of a decade 
of experience with online courses. She could have dived straight into this. And yet, even with that, she still felt the need to, I think I need to do a practice course. I mean, you can argue that maybe she needed it, maybe she didn't. I mean, it seems to have worked out great, so it's all good. But regardless of the need, if that's what you feel would be helpful, a lot of people can do that. You can say, this is the course I want to do, but it's intimidating. It's hard to get my head around for whatever reason. You can start with something smaller, simpler, more accessible feeling. And that doesn't take away from appreciating the wealth of experience and expertise you're bringing. It just, again, goes to let's shrink the scale of what it feels like we're taking on as a first step, because it is a first step. Whatever you do next is the first next step, not the be all and end all of what you're always forever going to do. Yeah. And that first step is really about getting you to the engagement and conversation with your participants that can lead you ultimately to a great course. I think for some reason, despite, you know, us talking about this for quite some time, there still seems to be this widespread perception that you can just like jump in and create a course and like build some content and then you have a nice course. And we know from hard won experience as well as to talking to people like Melissa that it just doesn't work that way. You've got to get your hands dirty and talk to people in these early stages and do a lot of iteration and and refinement to make something really good. So I guess the more different ways we can say that, (laughs) the better. Yeah, and online courses really suffer from like a bicycle shed problem, which is that most people have not built a bicycle shed, but they've seen one. It doesn't look that complicated. They're like, oh yeah, I guess I could figure out how to build a bicycle shed, even if they probably couldn't and don't have those skills. Nobody looks at a nuclear power plant. They're like, oh yeah, I could figure out how to build that. But some things have the illusion of simplicity. And because we've all seen so many online courses, we think we understand what it takes to produce it a lot more than we actually do. I had a friend who used to say, you know, I've turned a lot of light switches on and off. It doesn't make me an electrician. And in the same way, seeing, taking a lot of online courses, it gives us a sense of what they should include, but it doesn't mean we understand what goes into doing it really well. And yet that is the challenge that we have to overcome in this space. It gives the illusion that it's simpler than, than it actually is. And, and there is a learning curve, just like there is with anything else. Yeah, that's a fun analogy. I hadn't heard that one. All right, that's, that's all I got. Awesome. Thank you for listening to Course Lab. I'm Abe Crystal, co-founder and CEO of Riziku, here with Danny Eaney, founder and CEO of Miracy. Course Lab is part of the Miracy FM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Soul Savvy Business and Making It. This episode of Course Lab was produced by Cynthia Lamb. Jeff Govertson assembled the episode. Danny Eaney is our executive producer, post-production by Post Office Sound. Another thanks to Melissa for talking with us today. Remember, you can find out more about her over at witandwire.com. That's witandwire.com. To make sure you don't miss the excellent episodes coming up on Course Lab, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. And if you like the show, we'd love it if you could leave us a star review. It really does make a difference. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. And I'm here with my co-founder, Abe Crystal, the co-founder of Rizuku. I think you meant to say co-host. Was that not what I said? You gave him full credit for the company. Ah, all right, fine. Let's go again. I'm Danny Eaney, the co-founder. Ah, damn it. This does not bode well. (laughs) Good to get it out of the way early.